Hare Krishna, Yogeshwar Guru. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Thank you. What a pleasure to be with you again. Yes, it's my honor and pleasure, Prabhu. So, well, uh, I consider you a very dear friend, and I'm so grateful to you for the service that you do. It's very important. I hear from so many people how much they appreciate the discussions that you generate and, and uh, the guests you have. And please know it's uh, very appreciated, very much appreciated. Thank you, Prabhu. For me, it's a blessing to have us both, you know, it's like you're doing Vaishnava Sangha and Vaishnava Seva, both are happening. So <laughs> I've benefited both ways. I'm grateful for that. So we have had many discussions on topics of a wide range. So today I thought we could discuss on a topic which is, uh, which is in some ways related with both of us. You are an established author. I believe you also made documentaries and movies. And uh, I've been trying to do some writing. So creativity is also a part of, uh, at a broad range, human individuality. And also a part of, of spirituality, especially devotional spirituality, which involves using the senses. So we could talk broadly about nurturing creativity and specifically literary creativity you could go into uh, in, in a spiritual movement, in a, or you could say more in a, like a religious organization. I want to use a more provocative wording for that. You okay with that topic today? Oh my goodness. Thank you. You challenged me to to go deep into the ecstasies of Krishna consciousness. I'm grateful to you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so maybe I can start with a specific question. Were you always of a, did you always have a literary inclination, like writing and um, things like that? Yeah. Um, going back to uh, high school and, you know, I was always a, a journalist for the student newspaper in high school and then an editor of the university newspaper when I was in college. And then um, I was going for a career in journalism when I met devotees. Oh, okay. And uh, from the very beginning was fascinated with the, the, the literature of Krishna consciousness. And oh, okay. um, I used to spend a lot of time reading Prabhupada's books. There weren't very many in those early days, but uh, uh, Prabhupada even walked by my room one time and uh, he was traveling in Geneva and he saw me reading Chaitanya Charitamrita, I think. So the next morning in class, he, said, he was talking about the importance of reading and literature and books and saying, just like our Yogeshwara Prabhu, because he's so kind, because Yogeshwara Prabhu, uh, he is always reading our books. So this should be encouraged. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a big uh, appeal for me, was that there's this beautiful literature, and that it wasn't just philosophical, it was, it was poetic. The, the, you reach a point in your spiritual life where philosophy is no longer sufficient. You, uh, philosophy is to get you there. And, and once you're rolling downhill, you know, once your spiritual life gets going, then the words are not enough. You enter a world of, of song, of dance, of poetry, of, of paintings and, 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 and music. And, you know, look at the descriptions of the spiritual world. You know, there's some reading of books going on, you know, Uddhava and so on. But it's mostly it's the world of creativity, isn't it? It's the world of creativity. This is a beautiful thought, Ru, that In one sense, you can talk about philosophy. You could say it is necessary to say convince the head that this is what I should be doing in my life. But once when we connect our heart with Krishna, then it's more about creativity. As you said, song, dance, poetry, music. That's a beautiful continuum, I would say. Of course, we sure. can say we always study philosophy. But it is true that the Bhakti saints are not known so much for their philosophy as they are known for their spontaneously composed songs. Oh, no, we're a tradition of poets. Mm. You know, you the Goswamis there, they were writing dramas and, and, and poetry and songs, Narottam's beautiful songs, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, so many beautiful poetry and songs. And 
uh, Krishna uh, Das, uh, um, um, Kavi Karnapur, and uh, uh, you know our whole Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, wrote so much poetry. I think it may have been published a book of Prabhupada's poetry. Wonderful, this is beautiful. That's our tradition. We're a tradition of artists. So that's a beautiful way of looking at it. Now, if we consider creativity in, ter in those terms, at one level, if we focus on the missionary aspect of, uh, of Krishna consciousness, because I love this way you, it's, uh, it brought a new frame of thinking for me. Because in some ways, see, I used to write some small poetry before. And I started writing articles also. But in general, what I've noticed is that there is at least some appreciation, some encouragement for philosophical articles. But poetry, one of the comments I got, you know, has anyone ever become a devotee by reading a poetry? Then I said that, that you know, there are so many saints, they have written poet poems. They don't be singing the Vaishnava songs. I says, That's preposterous. You think you are like a saint? Who can sing, make Vaishnava songs which are going to attract people's hearts? So I said, <laughs> I, I didn't go into the discussion further. So obviously, I'm not that kind of saint. But if in our generation, we are going to have some, in our or future generations, if we are going to have some uh, people who are going to compose songs, well, they are going to start from somewhere. It's unlikely that maybe it's possible Krishna can do anything. But a fully perfected poet appears in our movement and starts spontaneously composing glorious, pure devotional songs for Krishna in English. It may, it may not happen overnight like that. So I don't want to start, start on a negative note, but this is the broad approach towards creativity, literary creativity I have seen. Oh, no, look, it, this is a critical point you bring up, very critical uh, in so many ways. Uh, on one level, for example, when... Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in the later years of his Leela on earth in Jagannath Puri. Um, his um, secretary, Sarup Damodar, would always first read any submission of poetry or literature that someone wanted to bring to read to Mahaprabhu to see whether it was authorized. You know? And there was uh, one example, I don't remember who it was. Uh, he started to, he got the very first line out and Sarup Damodar said, stop because yes. already there was some philosophical shortcoming. So in that sense, uh, we're very careful to not uh, create uh, a conflict with our Siddhanta. You know, any, anything that's done needs to be authentic. It needs to be in harmony and consonance with the, the core theology mm. of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. At the same time, you know, you don't want to set that bar so high that it that nobody can reach it. You know that that's the beauty of. I, I just I was just reading something. I want to read this too. This is um, from Krishna Chetra Swami. I'm. Uh, this is <laughs> this is one week reading here <laughs> for a course I'm taking with the the Oxford Center, and it's um, it's a course on uh, the history of the Gaudiya Vaishnav uh, culture. And it's just such a, an honor to be, to be studying Krishna consciousness in the company of such wonderful, brilliant devotee scholars. So in this one um, article, this is uh, a chapter in a book uh, published by Rutledge, an academic, respected academic publisher. The book is called uh, Circling In on the Subject, Discourses of Ultimacy, in Chaitanya Vaishnavism and reading. And uh, this is, um, I'm sorry, the name of the book is Chaitanya Vaishnava Philosophy. So in this one chapter, Krishna Chetraswami says, um, uh, uh, in this dynamic space of shifting horizons, present day Chaitanya Vaishnavas are finding that they must rethink and reapply the teachings of their tradition to make accessible and applicable the essential insights of Krishna Bhakti. Renewal of tradition, here's the point, renewal of tradition is an ongoing process and especially now in a world where critical philosophical thought is widely fostered, 
Chaitanya Vaishnavas find themselves called upon to re-examine all their presuppositions, just as they challenge others to do the same in the light of the Chaitanya claims about the nature and pursuit of ultimate truth as the defining feature of being fully human. In other words, we're not so much a religion, a dogma, as we are a worldview. As we are a and a world, a worldview. World you know, in German, you know, we're we're a view of what life is all about. And it is our the core of our theology that every living being has a unique relationship with God. Mm. There is no one size fits all here. And because each of us is a unique individual with our own extremely specific relationship with God, the expression of that love is also uniquely individual. We have to be prepared to allow that to happen. There was a time, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, when I had a real difficulty with um, all of these kirtan groups coming up. You know, we've got dozens, if not hundreds of Kirtan groups using, you know, electrical instruments and <laughs> doing all kinds of, you know, bossa nova beats and, and, and you know, samba beats and, and uh, you know, bringing all kinds of other influences into a musical vernacular that has its own tradition. And I used to wonder, is this, you know, sahaja? Is this rasa basa? Is it just plain wrong? But then I realized, well, look at the results. The results are so many people, particularly young people, but not just young people, are becoming attracted by talented musicians. So it, the, the attraction may not be initially that they're understanding the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, but it is a point of entry for a lot of people. It's a point of entry. So I've become a little softer about it. You know, I mean, just between you and me and your, and your 10 million viewers, um, my personal taste in music go, is jazz. I, I have a classic jazz, you know, John Coltrane, Miles. You know, I, I go for the classics, Bill Evans, um, because there's something in the spontaneity of jazz improvisation that reminds me of, of uh, Raghunuga Bhakti. You know, it's, 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 you know, a lot of jazz musicians, jazz artists started off in classical music. You have to master the basics. You got to know the scales before you can start improvising. Get the basics. Done. That's Krishna consciousness. You know, you you start with uh, a devotional service and practice. You know? Then good. you can begin to improvise. So there's a kind of a metaphor there in jazz, and I find that very uh, inspiring. Uh, so I guess I've learn to loosen up a little bit when it comes to me. So we can't be so strict. We shouldn't set the bar so high that only three people can come to Krishna consciousness. I mean, okay. Mahaprabhu's mission was to engage everybody and allow them to come and use their God-given creative talents in God's service. Mm. So, so that means we, that there'll be like a tension between a person spontaneously expressing their devotion through their creativity and their being able to align their understanding of devotion and their expression of devotion uh, with what the what is the normative in the tradition would that be something uh, some other way of articulating this no no that's quite good uh, let's put it we can also phrase it this way that someone with some creative abilities will find that their creative expressions achieve greater heights if they are well grounded in the basics of bhakti theology. If they're trying to engage their musical talents, artistic talents, whatever it may be, in Krishna's service, hmm. make sure you understand the, the ground that you're tilling here. Make sure that you have a sense of what the material is that you're working with so that your expression becomes as beautiful as it can possibly be. So, you know, because we've, 
we've seen, for example, artwork, you know, and go back to the beginning of the paintings uh, for Bhagavad Gita and so on. Prabhupada approved them because they were sincere expressions and he made sure that the content was, was accurate. Stylistically, creatively, artistically, it was naive, a lot of the work. As the artists became more deeply entrenched in their understanding of the subject matter and practiced, practiced how do you get to Vaikuntha? Practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, the more they did their art, uh, the more the aesthetic quality of the work of, you know, shall we take what they do. Now, is that the only way? No, of course not. We have a god brother named uh, Mahaprabhu, this artist from, uh, from Uruguay, I think. And uh, he has art exhibits. Uh, he, I think his art gallery is in Belgium. But he creates yeah, this I have my podcast, you know, extraordinary magnificent work you know, the range of, of, of artists that he's found. And they're everything from abstract to modern to cubist to uh, traditional, you know, schools of thought. Very, very wide range. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all valid. You know, it's not it's not that there's only one way. That's the you know, I asked Prabhupada one time. Uh, this was about. Uh, I was supposed to do something for him, and uh, it was in Paris, and I was going out and. There was something different. I don't remember exactly what it was. So I said, Bila Prabhupada, if, if, uh, if we're trying to do something for you and we don't have a direct uh, uh, instruction from your books or a chance to talk with you about it, to know exactly, precisely how to do something, um, how should we go know that we're doing it the right way? He said, you can use your intelligence. He says, there's, there's two things. There's Vediki and Loki. Mm -hmm. Vediki means in the Vedas. It's, it's, it's positive. It's in the text. And you can read it. Here's how you do this. Lokiki means according to the loka, the situation, uh, where there may not be a direct explanation. If your motive is pure, if you're grounded in a knowledge of the philosophy and Ideally, if you can have approval of the Vaishnava community, but that may not always be possible, it will be accepted. You know, there's something about the motive behind service that's, that's essential. Mm. We, we know that uh, even someone with very, very modest talent, if their heart is good and their, their motive is, is to express that love, God will accept it. Krishna will accept that. You know, he's... You, you, you can't uh, wow him with your artistic skills. Prabhupada uh, left. Beautiful way of putting it. So this is a nice way of, <laughs> normally we talk about, we can't wow Krishna with our wealth. That, you know, Krishna accepts even a fruit and a flower. But the way you're putting it, yes, we can't, if we can't <laughs> impress Krishna with anything material, that also would mean even creative ability. I remember there's an yes. incident that when Bhakti Sansa Thakur was about to depart from the world, he wanted, the, the famous Kirtan of the Gaudiya Mat was about to sing Kirtan for him. He said, no, no, get the other devotee. And that devotee was not a very well-known singer, but he had quite, he's known to have quite a devoted heart. So it seems the import that his followers got was that to attract the public, we may have a person who is a good singer, but ultimately at the time of departure, at that time, the time that mattered the most, Bhagavan Sri wanted to have somebody who was not so much necessarily musical, but pure-hearted. Now, that's your qualification as the listener. When you can make the distinction between artistic um, facility and devotional facility, that's, that's to your credit. If you can listen, and instead of just... Uh, wanting technical prowess you know some some great display of talent if you hear the heart and soul coming through that's your credit that's your spiritual progress Prabhupada left uh, it was london and one of the children there had given him a drawing it was uh this a crayon drawing of krishna playing with you know <laughs> not 
artistically very accomplished. On the plane ride, his secretary told me he pinned that drawing of Krishna to the back of the seat in front of him. And that's what he was using when he was chanting his job. Looking at that child's drawing of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Artistically, it wasn't very accomplished. But there, it was the heart and soul and, and loving offering of a child. How much more do you want in life? That's, so, so there are two distinct you know, that's, things here now. That's a, I mean, mm -hmm. there is material skill, or we could say the material dimension of ability. At one level, that is also, we could say, an opulence of Krishna. Because Krishna says everything yes. actually comes from him. So the presence of a material ability, especially extraordinary material ability, is an is a blessing of Krishna, is a manifestation of Krishna. Now, whether a person will use that to themselves move toward Krishna or take others toward Krishna, that is up to their free will. So in one sense, if our interest is in moving toward Krishna, then we can be Krishna conscious whenever we see any extraordinary skill in anyone. But we don't ourselves get carried away by it. Just because this person has extraordinary skill doesn't necessarily mean that they are a great devotee. We, we appreciate that extraordinary skill as a manifestation of Krishna, but then we also evaluate that, is this actually taking me toward Krishna? So that way, in, there are two, we could say there are two levels of Krishna consciousness when we encounter some skills. Would that be a fair understanding? I, it is a fair understanding. I think there's another dimension, though, that needs to be added here. Please, yeah. And that is that um, ultimately, we want people to know that we care for them. We want people to know that we are concerned for their well-being. We wish to be of service to them in their spiritual life. And sometimes that means just reaching out to them where they are, not converting them to our point of view or something, but being comfortable enough within our own mm. covenant with God that just that expression of love for someone else, they'll come to the conclusion. They'll come to that decision that now I wish to direct my energies in a different way. There, there was no way that the devotees who met George Harrison back in London in 1968-69 could have, you know, preached at him, you should write songs about Krishna, you know, and expect that he was going to take them. Mm -hmm. When he came of his own free will to the point of recognizing, you know, the, uh, excuse my imitation of George Harrison, at one point in an interview said, you know, I could write all kinds of songs I wanted to, you know, hey, baby, what you gonna do? He says, but I, I don't want to do that. He says, I, I'd rather write something that has some lasting value. That's why he began writing beautiful Krishna conscious songs, living in the material world, you know, from the spiritual sky, such sweet memories have I, you know, uh, I pray, I pray that I won't get caught up uh, and stay in the material world, you know, and chanting Hare Krishna, and my goodness, what amazing talent. But you can't force that. You, you, you can't, you know, insist on it. So sometimes I think we have to be prepared to just encourage people where they are, where they are even if it doesn't seem to have any connection with Krishna consciousness. That's difficult because to do that, you have to be very self-aware and very comfortable in your own spiritual life because otherwise you're going to find it threatening. This, this I think, is the next stage in our evolution as a movement for Srila Prabhupada. And, and this is a very serious subject for me. I've just spent 
three years putting together a code of ethical behavior, which thank goodness the GBC voted into law, which is attempting in essence to say that you cannot separate your behavior from your spiritual progress. Your advancement in Krishna consciousness will be tied, will be commensurate to how much your behavior rises, becomes something exemplary. Not conversional, but compassionate uh, is, is the quality to strive for. And that means uh, appreciate. Let me just interrupt you a little bit. So you could say, when you say not, compa- not conversional, but compassionate, many, many devotees may think that conversion is itself compassion. But uh, in one sense, Prabhupada never used the word conversion. And when the word conversion has a, has a tone of forcing, of, uh, of say, not respecting the individuality and the free will of the person, of almost treating the person as an insentient object who has to be, who has to be changed. So yes, what he is saying is that there's self-acceptance of the person has to be there, wherever they are, and then move forward from there. First of all, there's no converting to Krishna consciousness. That, that's an illusion. That's a mistake. That is philosophically a mistake. The soul does not convert to become a Vaishnava. You're already Atma. You're already a spark of God. You don't convert to become it. I, I think when we become... Two... <laughs> so this, I've had so many discussions on this topic. This is such a foundational <laughs> point that yeah. in one sense... Uh, the word conversion just doesn't apply because at all we are talking about some external upadhis for the soul which are being changed. But that is, if we understand that we are the soul, then we don't belong to any religion, we don't belong to any, any particular faith at all. So where is the question of conversion? Hmm. So it's more of, we could say, it's more of, of realization, of awakening rather than conversion. And then there could be different ways to awaken also different ways to gain realization. Right. Yeah, it's fascinating. I have to say, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, talking with you is a deep dive. It's a very deep dive. It's, um, it's, it's never uh, shallow. You, know, you, you know, you get into some really, really important issues. Here. Um, we are talking, after all, about retrieving our souls. We're talking mm-hmm. about the a shift in the direction of humanity, you know, it's a tragic time, bro. In my life, I'm 71 years old, and I cannot remember a moment in my life when when the world was was in such a a tragic and complex state of affairs. I mean, there was always problems. There was always fighting and so on, some hatred or, but but what's happening right now? Uh, it's very, very, very challenging. So, you know, the stakes are high. You know, what we're talking about here, I, I'm glad that you and I can have lighthearted conversations, you know, conversations mm-hmm. that have room for some humor and so on. But ultimately, the subject is very deep. I mean, when you talk about creativity, mm-hmm. you're talking about one of the most powerful forces in the universe. I mean, what is creativity? It's God. When we talk about God, we're talking about the creative force, the force behind creation. We talk about cre- what is creation? It is a creative act. So this is a very important subject that you've raised. This is not a small thing. Mm-hmm. Look, it's you know, when, when you... I, ah, right. please. When you connected this, yeah. let's say, it is creativity connecting with God. I was just thinking of Krishna talks about how he manifests as the essence of everything. So he says, I am the ability in you people. That could be one thing, Paurusham Drishu. That could be one way we could connect that he's creativity. And of course, he says, I give knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So that could also be creativity. Uh, now, it's generally understood by anybody who's in the creative field that there's something higher that grips me and speaks through me or works through me. Now, they may not always accept that it is God, but they know there's something there. 
So is there, are there any other points in philosophy that, in our, our philosophy which, which say, uh, which say associate creativity or the creative force with Krishna? We have the literal creation and Brahmaji gets spray energy from Krishna, but that's more of a physical, you could say, uh, physical creation. But when you talk about the creative arts, well, you just quoted verses from Bhagavad Gita. I think it was ninth chapter. Uh, Krishna says, I'm the, I'm the ability and I'm the intelligence. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a very direct hmm. evidence of creativity as, as God inspired. Also, historically, there are, um, there's like a, math, a German mathematician named Gauss, G A U S S, back in, I think, of the 1700s or 1800s, who, um, say that you know he would be working on mathematical problems something very complicated couldn't figure it out and he'd go to sleep and in the morning he says right the, the answer was there he says as though i was being inspired by some higher power <laughs> and mm -hmm. um mozart mozart also said that uh, when he was writing symphonies he says there are times when it's 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 like it's being given to me it's already it's there in my mind and all that I'm doing is transcribing it. So there are many examples like that where people will say, I don't, you know, the nature of inspiration is something that comes from some higher force in the universe. You know, I'm, I'm just a vehicle for this. And there are, uh, there's research that was conducted by a Hungarian sociologist who just died last year. His name was Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Okay. He wrote a book back in the 1990s, I believe, called Flow, F-L-O-W, Flow. Yes, it's a well-known book, yeah. On, yeah, on peak, he called it, or peak experience. And he sent researchers, I think was, don't remember what university he was, out in the Midwest somewhere. Massachusetts, no, no, uh, Chicago or something. Anyway, he sent researchers, just postdocs around the world, interviewing people, artists, poets, musicians, athletes, heads of corporation, and then less, lesser lights, you know, cheesemakers and gardeners and uh, Sherpas in the Himalayas, I mean, just a whole range of humanity, thousands and thousands of interviews. And what he found was that what makes them happy, what makes people happy, that was his idea. He wanted to find what is there something that makes everybody, no matter where they come from, what their economic status or their cultural background, is there something that makes everybody happy? What he found was in the creative process, one can find happiness. And what was interesting about this, everyone he talked to, all of his researchers said the same thing. They said, what makes me happy about doing what I'm doing is the process. Let me interview a, a painter, a painting. Look what I did, right? You can hang it, you can display it, you can put it in a gallery, you can publish it in a book, you can sell it, you can get it reviewed, you know, you make your reputation by the finished art. And the, the painter said, no, it's in the, in the painting, in the process. And across the board, it was always like this. There was a, 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 gold medal, a, a gold medal Olympic figure skater, can't remember her name, who said that when she was doing her gold medal performance, she said, I, I disappeared. <laughs> the music took over. I was just kind of doing it. So all of these people interviewed, they gave a similar description that there was no ego in the work for them anymore. They felt like they were serving the experience of their music, their poetry, their gardening, uh, their business, whatever it was, that they felt a certain timelessness to it, that it gave them great joy. And I say, wait a minute, this sounds familiar. So I went to the Bhagavad Gita. And you know those verses where Krishna describes samadhi? In the Bhagavad Gita, he Maybe. says, in this state of samadhi, there is no higher uh, uh, joy to be achieved, 
yeah. there is a sense of fulfillment and the same qualities as flow in his research around the world. They're involved. The point is that the, the true experience of satisfaction and joy in the creative act is one that is devoid of ego, where you're allowing God to work through you. But here's what's interesting about that. Most artists are terrible egotists. They're hard. They're the worst. <laughs> they're so full of themselves. You know, in my career, I've had a chance to work with some very famous artists, actors and musicians. And a lot of them are really egotistical. You know, oh, look what I do. The, the best among them said, I felt so privileged to be allowed to help provide this. That's, that's a, a Vaishnav trait. It's a Vaishnav fault that I have these skills by God's grace. Uh, let me now engage them. Mm. This is beautiful. So there are two distinct things then. One is that actually, in one sense, the ego disappears. And at a small level, I think, Everybody has had that experience when you just get completely immersed in something. And, uh, but at another level, just our ability to do something, something which others can't do. That can, that can, it's almost, you could say, a human vulnerability, universal human vulnerability to succumb to the ego. So if, if I put it this way, that only if one has Krishna consciousness, then actually... One can balance that understand not only not Krishna consciousness, Krishna consciousness, God consciousness, some understanding of God consciousness. We can balance, you could say, the the weight of that talent without getting inflated by it. No, oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for saying it like that. That's the operative word is manage. Manage it. You don't destroy ego. Uh, Krishna consciousness is not a negation of ego. It's a managing of the ego. You know, there's that verse in um, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, Yogas Chitta Bharati Naroda. The word Naroda is often described as, um, you know, negating the Chitta Bharatis of the mind. A more informed translation of Naroda would be to say manage, to manage. You, ego is the self. You can't destroy the self. The material ego gets in the way. You have to manage that. And a really accomplished artist knows to take that ego and sublimate it, channel it into the art so that it's no longer about me. I've been given these skills. This is my ego. This is my material toolbox. Now let me engage that. It's a careful balance and, and it takes a lot of practice, a lot of chanting, <laughs> a lot of chanting. Mm. Come to the place of where you're so comfortable with yourself as a human being i'm not talking about comfortable as a devotee comfortable with yourself as a human being that i have had tragedies in my life but they don't define me i'm something different i have to tell you chaitanya char when you and i have our conversations i take the long view i think about people 10 20 30 50 years down the line who may be listening to us discussing here. And I, I try to feel compassion for them because you and I know from our own experience, trying to be a devotee is hard work. It's not always pleasant. It's not always pleasant. And, you know, today, a lot of devotees in ISKCON are from, you know, Hindu parents. They didn't ask for this. They didn't, they didn't volunteer to become devotees. That's how they were brought up. And very often, unfortunately, parents don't know how to raise their children in a very informed Krishna conscious way. So I know from my own contact with the younger generations how difficult it is for them. So when you and I talk, I, I think about the long view. I think about people who may be struggling with their own devotional life. And they're trying to balance it. They're trying to put it all together. It's so hard to do. 
you know, I, I have these creative impulses, but then I think that's Maya. Right? That, that's one mistaken idea that people have is that all of that's Maya. You know, it's a rejection. Rejection is just the opposite side of attraction. It's not, it's not transcendental. It's still in the material realm. I have seen many times, yeah. even devotees, not devotees, authors in general, they often treat their literary products like a baby. You know, every book is like a baby that <laughs> it has come. So in that sense, yeah. there's a very intimate bond between creativity and uh, person. You know, I was asking one senior devotee, you know, that, you know, you have spoken so much on this topic. Why don't you write on this topic? He said that uh, it was very striking. I was in the early stages, I was maybe five, six years uh, a devotee and I was just uh, learning to write. He said, for me, writing on a topic is like marrying that topic. I can't just marry anyone. So it's very, it is very, you could say a non-functional, non-occupational way of looking at writing. Mm. So I was struck with that very first day with me. Well, the, right, the, the, the creative process is also very threatening. You know, I've known some actors, some professional actors who would say things to me like, um, you know, getting up on stage was taking, taking their life in their hands. I used to think, come on, what are you talking about? You're an actor. You're getting up on stage. You're acting. How is that life threatening? You know, what does a creative person do? Well, she's putting her creative art, her creative expression out there for the world to see. That's what makes it so threatening. I mean, mm. Actors I've known who've said getting up on stage was taking their life in their hands. I never understood what that meant until one professional actor said to me, you don't understand. He said, if you're being a true actor, true to your craft, you're embodying that person on stage. And that means that through that part that you're playing, all of your own life experiences are coming out, your fears, your anxieties, your insecurities, your self-doubts, your bitterness, your anger, your hostility, your disappointments, the tragedies of your life. You're putting it out there for the world to see, the world to judge you by what you're doing on stage. I, and then I began to understand that, for example, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his associates used to do plays. And then when they performed these plays, the audience would be weeping in tears. Prabhupada also said when he was a young man, they, they were doing a devotional play. I can't remember which part he performed. He was Chaitanya Lila. And he looked out in the audience and saw that people were crying. It's because there's that that's that's the heart and soul of, of, of the bhakti tradition you know is that you are recreating these transcendental emotions through the creative act yeah i think we have to distinguish between creativity as an expression of love and creativity as a commercial endeavor i've known artists who were talented but who chose to uh, direct their talents for commercial purposes. And uh, that's fine. Everyone's entitled to earn a living. But I think you and I are talking about creativ creativity in a different sense. I think we're talking about creativity as, as a tool of self-awareness, a tool of reflecting the majesty of creation in creative art. Beautifully put, yeah. Uh, so, and, and again, taking that long view that there will be people who listen to your podcasts and if we have something to offer them, something that will be of value to them, it would be to say, do not fear your own creative abilities. Do not doubt them. Go deeper inside their meaning. Try to understand why they have been given to. I once asked Srila Prabhupada, what is the meaning of art in Krishna consciousness? Who is an artist in Krishna consciousness? This was in Paris. He said, 
An artist is someone who puts something in its proper place for best utility. And I didn't understand what he meant. So after a long discussion with him, I'll, I'm just summarizing it for you. It was clear that what he was saying was that each of us, every human being walking the planet, has some creative talent, some creative ability. And I suspect that it is that same creative energy, that God-given energy that inspires some people to build a business, inspires other people to write a song or paint a painting. And it can inspire others to create a family. Beautiful. Okay. That creative act, when it's done in that spirit of uh, my dear Lord, I'm so grateful for this life that you've given me. Let me offer something back to you. Let me try to express to others the miracle of, of the life that you have created. That's, that's like putting your finger in the, in the wall socket. You know, you, you can energize your creative abilities beyond whatever, you know, karmic limitations you might have had otherwise. If there was no background cosmic spiritual reality, then everybody with some creative talent would be equally successful, equally famous, equally effective. That's not the case. There are other invisible forces at work. And Unless you're one of that handful of really gifted artists who comes along in a generation who just, you are your art, you are your talent. And that's very, very few. I wouldn't presume, I would hope nobody listening to this podcast presumes to be one of those people, you know, one of the really greats. Then we have to be a little more modest in our self-assessment and ask for help. I mean, what is chanting Hare Krishna if not asking for help? You know, please engage me in your service. So in other words, the bottom line is if you'd like to be a better artist, chant, chant, chant. Beautifully put. It's more a, not just a mechanical, or even a, not mechanical, not, for us, it's not just art. It's a, you could say it's an expression of the heart. A heart that wants to love Krishna, uh, then, so we may have a little ability, we may have a lot of ability, but what, our we can go beyond our karmic limitations. Yeah. That's an amazing way of looking at it. So, you know, we've got three, four different perspectives on art right now. One is uh, that, I mean, we discuss a lot, but I'm just trying to phrase it in a beautiful way that art is what bhakti is about once. One is on the path, we express it through express it through art. Then we discuss also how art is, uh, just now you mentioned this, that art is not just a, for us, art is not meant to be an expression of the ego. Actually, in one sense, it's a, it's a sublimation of the ego, what we mentioned earlier. Then just now I mentioned about how art is uh, meant and that there could be art as an expression of one's talent and art could be an expression of one's love. Mm -hmm. These are amazing perspectives. And then right now you mentioned that art when we try to do it in Krishna's service, it could be, it could take us far beyond what our normal capacities or normal, normal karmic gifts could be. There's a lot to reflect. Well, well, let me give you a, a personal example. Let me use myself as an example. You mentioned this at the beginning. I've had a little success as a writer. I mean, if I had to put a number on it, my books have sold something like a half million copies or not. Most of them have been biographies of Holocaust survivors. Mm. But do you see what's behind me? This altar here? It's Gornitai? Yeah. Okay. I've, I didn't have deities in my home until about eight months ago. Because my current book is a biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it was very clear to me that no matter what material skill I may have in writing biographies, there's no way that I can write a biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu without the grace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I installed deities here in my home so that every morning I could throw myself at their feet and beg them 
please give me the opportunity to glorify you by helping me to know how you would like your story told. How shall I tell your story? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I hope I'm smart enough now after, you know, 50 some odd years in Krishna consciousness to know the difference between a creative ability like writing applied to an assignment and a creative act that's trying to bring me closer to God. So, It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for anyone who wants to be creative in whatever way. Creative in sewing an outfit. Creative in cooking. Creative in managing a business. Creative in IT. Creative in accounting. Creative in financial services. Creative in, in what, whatever expression you have. You can bring something to that. You can actually bring another dimension to whatever you're doing through that act of prapati, that self-surrender, because then it opens up vistas, understandings of what you're doing that you cannot understand otherwise. You know, in, in Brahma Samhita, andan tarastam paramanu chayan tarastam, God is in every atom. What it means is, the experiences of your life. There's what you can understand of it just on the surface. But then inside it, there's God. There's God inside every moment of your life. Every effort that you make, if you have the vision to see God there, that becomes service, that becomes devotion. Amazing. I mean, what an opportunity. What an opportunity Krishna consciousness is for every human being to make every creative act of their life blossom into love for God. And through that love, connection with every living being in the world. <sighs> Sorry, I get a little carried away. <laughs> I wish it's I fun. could get carried away with you. <laughs> what a beautiful vision. <laughs> yeah. So this is, you know, I've been thinking that this is a very, uh, sometimes I talk, of, use two words, maybe you could come up with better words. Like there could be like a, you could say an intensive practice of Krishna consciousness and there could be like an inclusive or an expansive practice of Krishna consciousness. By intensive, you mean chanting, deity worship, studying scriptures, going to holy places, like what we call as the five potent forms of devotional service. That we are, in one sense, we are directly connecting with Krishna. So, um, if we consider, uh, but there are many other ways to connect with Krishna also. And uh, in fact, uh, so we could now, we could say music is a part of Kirtan and in that direct connection, but like writing uh, art, literature and all those things, those are also ways of connecting with Krishna. And in fact, not only those, every endeavor is a way of connecting with Krishna. You know, one section of the Gita, which we don't often talk about, recently I have been meditating and speaking on that is, when Krishna talks about transforming one's work into worship. That is a theme which we don't talk about so much. So in one sense, I was thinking when you talk about the deities, you know, there, is a, about, there is a spiritual mercy for writing about Lord Chaitanya. And there is, you could say also, I don't like to use the word material because somehow we have the word material with a negative connotation, but the ability. So decades of training you have got and then decades of training from a, as an author and now decades of training as a devotee. So that you could say the Ganga and Jamuna are coming together now. And <laughs> now you got, <laughs> got the mercy of the deities. So that is like the Saraswati. So your book on Lord Chaitanya will be like a Triveni Sangam. Hmm. Your blessings. I'm the one to bless. I would look forward to reading it. <laughs> That's amazing. So what an extraordinary world that we've been invited into. It's incredible. Universe, Krishna consciousness. Yes. It's just mm -hmm. marvelous. It's so marvelous. That's true.
So, bro, this is amazing. And uh, I mean, it's amazing how you expanded the horizons. Maybe we could uh, come down to a little uh, ground level of, say, we have a young devotee who started practicing bhakti. And how could they go about nourishing their creativity? Because in general, there is a lot of emphasis in the early stages, at least, on conformity rather than creativity. You know, do this, mm. don't do this, do this, don't do this. And now this could be a big subject, but in some ways, uh, at least in India, in our outreach, uh, we have attracted a lot of young people, but it's more, you could say, people from the engineering background, not so much from the art backgrounds. In the humanities, the art backgrounds, we are not focused our devotees are not focused much also on that outer area, but in general, how do we, how does on one side, a person with creativity be a part of an organization that requires, or a path that requires a certain level of conformity. And on the other side, as we as leaders in a movement, we know that we have certain standards which require certain level of conformity. So how do we give space for creativity? We discussed this a little bit earlier. In terms of compassion, not conversion, but maybe with a focus on upcoming devotees, you would like to say some things? Well, for, um, first, I'm, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what that experience is like. like. But from what I'm observing, <clears throat> the people in IT who make the greatest contributions are the ones who have the greatest imagination. They, 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 they look at a system and they don't see only the inside of that system. They see its potential for expansion outside. So they, they see its relationship with other systems. So they're making connect, creative connections. Uh, and it may be that there's a unifying theme across all levels of activity that you can go deeper inside it. You can always go deeper inside the experience of something. But I think, I think you're um, addressing a somewhat different point. I think what you're saying is the ISKCON movement is a very structured environment. So how do we make room for creativity inside that structure? Am I understanding you correctly? That's beautifully put, yeah. All right. I was talking with one devotee. He was saying that even the prayers are so structured. I can't even believe alone express creativity other way. Like I'm not even, I can't even pray to Krishna in my own way. So I explained, you know, there are personal prayers also. And, but it does, a, a structured is a very good word for it. Conformity has a little negative connotation. But yeah. structure is a much better word over there. Yeah. Well, conformity is structure taken to an extreme. I mean, I think there are some people who require conformity because they they find some kind of comfort. In, you know, it's a it's a very threatening world out there, and, and um, there's a shelter in numbers. You might say, if you become invisible by becoming part of a group where you don't stand out, <laughs> then maybe n nothing will hurt me because I'm, you know, I'm protected by the institution. Mm. I'm protected by being a part of a community. And that, that's fine uh, initially, but uh, you've got to grow up, grow up someday. Um, it's not bad. You know, in my old age, I've come to appreciate the con conservative elements within ISCOM. They're there to protect best practices, to preserve the tradition, to make sure that wild-eyed liberals like me don't rock the boat too hard. And, um, and that's important. That's important. You know, you don't, you can't, you can't take such creative liberties that you threaten the very foundation of the thing that you're trying to represent. That's not, that's not a good idea. So that structure, the, if you will, the conservative element, is, is, that's important to the, to the strength of the edifice itself. But that can't be the only thing. 
Otherwise, we'll become anath uh, anachronistic. We'll become stuck in time. We'll never grow. We'll never change. And just like that quote I gave you from Krishna Chetraswami, we are at a moment in time now, 50 whatever, six years since the beginning of our movement, where we are compelled by our time in history to revisit every one of the assumptions we've made about what is Krishna consciousness and consider its application in this ever evolving world around us. Otherwise we're gonna become irrelevant. You know, I, I don't know if I ever told you this. I used to have an office in the Empire State Building and uh, on the 56th floor. And there were times in, in um, strong winds when you felt the building moving. You actually felt the building moving. And I looked into it and was, it was explained to me that when the architects built the Empire State Building, they made a, a composite metal uh, skeleton that had flexibility built into it because they knew at those heights, the wind would shake the building, would push it. And if they did not incorporate flexibility into the steel structure, it would crack in the building, would collapse. Mm. Flexibility is inherent to strong structure. It's not the enemy of strong structure. It is the enhancement that makes strength what it is. The same is true with an institution as much as with a building. You have to include a degree of flexibility. Otherwise, it's going to break. It's going to dissolve. In the passage of time. The way you put it is very nice. That flexibility is not just a necessity, you could say it's also intrinsic. It's, it's not like a circumstantial adjustment for survival. It is flexibility that builds strength. We also say that like the trees that bend don't break. A bending is a little bit of a negative connotation. You may say hey, we don't want to bend. We don't want, but I think. Uh, it's also the, you can have a metaphor of a river. A river doesn't stick to one path. You know, it moves round and round, but keeps moving forward. So that flexibility to go around, to find a way ahead is what keeps it going. Yeah. It's flexibility. Sometimes, you know, uh, there's some controversy in our society because certain cultures around the world, I mean, this kind of represents every country in the world, every culture in the world. And some of them are more traditional than others. And, um, it's understandable that certain collections of people will want to adhere firmly to tradition. You know, tradition is what makes us comfortable. It's what's familiar. It's what's worked in the past. It, 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 it is who we are, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, you don't want to see that change, you know? I think one of the... It's kind of an emotional issue for me. Um, I lost my mother you know, last year. You know, talking. Yeah, you talked about and, it. And, and part of the, the, uh, the, the grief of that for me is that um, she represented a world that has disappeared. The world that I grew up in. It was a world where there were certain givens about democracy and the democratic process. You know? There were certain givens, dependable elements to journalism. You know, I grew up in the time of Walter Cronkite and uh, McNeil Lair, and, you know, real journalists. I don't see much real journalism today. I see a lot of reporting. I see a lot of aggregated news. I don't see much real journalism. Mm. There was a time when you could leave your door open. You know, we were kids in my building in midtown New York City, in our building, a 15 story apartment building. We left our doors open. You could come into people's homes because <laughs> we were all friends. It was like one big family. You can't leave, you wouldn't dare leave your apartment door open now. You wouldn't dare leave your car door unlocked today. There was a time when, you know, I was raised in a liberal democratic Jewish family. We had friends who were 
Christian Republicans. Their kids went to the same school that I went to and we got together for picnics or, or you know, whatever, family dinners or holidays. Or, and you could have discussions about differences of opinion. There wasn't anything like the hostility we're seeing today. There wasn't any of this kind of deadly vitriol, this bitterness and, and, and um, utter cutthroat. Mm. It's so embarrassing just to think about it. So part of the grief of my loss of my mother sorry, was this room. Sorry, I just wanted to, maybe this could be a subject which could be separately explored. But one thing I felt Prabhu, is that even India is happening. In some ways, politics is becoming like an alternative religion for people. Yes. And that's yes. why it's not just you have a different opinion. It's not just you are wrong. You are evil. That's where it goes to. Yeah. No, I think you've put your finger on it. Yeah. That's, that's a betrayal of tradition. That's not a respect for tradition. And this is what people don't understand. When you try to adhere so tenaciously, so fanatically to tradition, you betray your, your tradition. Because if you look back and you study your tradition, you will see that it is something that evolved over time. The thing that you're remembering, the thing that makes you comfortable, oh yes, when we did it like this. Go back a few generations. That's not how it was done. <laughs> There's been an evolution over time and it's a constant evolution. Tradition too, like people, grow and change. And the unwillingness to accept that is the cause of war. The unwillingness to accept that, you know, I have to revisit my own faith if we're ever going to see a, a peaceful world, I have to be the change. There's a famous Gandhi quote like that. Mm. But there's also a quote from uh, Carl Jung, the uh, psychologist, who said, what if the greatest of offenders, what if those who need to change the most end up being me. What then? You I think it's a sign of maturity, both mm -hmm. psychically and spiritually, to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, where can I improve? Where can I do better? Where am I being, where am I the victim of my own fears? Mm -hmm. So Carl Jung said something similar in another context that he said modern man cannot see God because it doesn't bend low enough or look down low enough. That means his point was that we don't look at the darkest parts inside us and we just focus on, on other things. We think that we have a self-congratulatory vision of ourselves sometimes. So just trying to connect this. How are we? We discussed about uh, conform. If I understand right, the flow is, I had asked about uh, there is a structured environment in which bhakti is practiced in our organization. And when structure taken too far, becomes, too far becomes conformity. And then now you're talking about when conformity is being imposed too strongly by someone, that could be because of their own insecurity. That's because what, what is it that I need to fix? Is that what, where the direction is going? Yeah, you're right. The, the, the connection is there's nothing wrong. If you want to be a traditionalist, if you want to be a conservative, if you wish to be, um, you know, an upholder of tradition, if you, if you want to take that, you know, right of center position, fine, wonderful. God bless you, you know, for, for protecting what is valuable about our heritage. But don't be your own worst enemy. Don't be so entrenched about what it is that you're trying to defend that you end up being the one who hurts it. You wonderfully put, okay. So we're talking about giving space for people who are, want to be, who, who, need to, who need to be creative, that don't be so traditionalist. You can be a That's, traditionalist, but don't impose that on others. Don't yeah, impose don't, that on everyone else. 
That's right. You may not like it, but that doesn't mean that it has no value in the universe of devotional service. Don't think that your standards are so high and mighty that the whole world has to think like you. Mm. Who are you to set the standard for the whole world? What do you know? Mm. You're entitled to your position. And it's the beauty of Krishna consciousness that it's so flexible that it can include even, you know, stubborn heads like yours. We are Prabhupada often talk about principles and details. Sometimes the word detail becomes a little, you could say, non-specific. How do we understand what details? So one way I try to elaborate details is, is preferences. You know, there are certain principles which are inviolable. But there are many things in Krishna consciousness which are personal preferences. And when we try to make the preference, okay, like somebody may say that prayer should be offered only by singing Vaishnava songs. Okay, you should not compose your own prayers. Well, maybe that is the way your heart connects with Krishna. But that doesn't necessarily mean everybody's heart will connect with Krishna in that way. So praying to Krishna, Vandanam is a principle. But how a particular person finds their heart connecting with best with Krishna, you could say that is a preference. So just because somebody is say composing their own prayers, not for everyone to sing, but just for themselves to offer to the Lord, that shouldn't make somebody who is a little more conservative feel insecure or label the other. They shouldn't label the other person as a deviant. No, appreciate it. Appreciate what they're doing. They're expressing their love for Krishna in their own way. Why, why should you object to that? Oh, it's not up to the standard. Well, the heck with you. Go, go live with your standard in a closet somewhere. We, we have to be able to, it's a big world. Our whole mission, we're, we're driven, we're compelled by our Krishna consciousness to feel love for every living being, compassion for the struggles they go through, and to cultivate our ability to encourage them. Mm. That's your gift. Your gift is how you can encourage others to serve. So it may not be your taste. Okay. You think that Prabhupada came here and everything was to his taste? If everything had to be his taste in order for him to stay and continue his movement, (laughs) he would have gone back to India after day one. (laughs) <laughs> he's the ultimate example of someone who was able to embrace everybody there was one guy named uh, Green I, forgot. Yeah, I know he had the same name as mine he was a, uh, a modernist uh, composer he used to come to the 26th 2nd Avenue Temple that he, he had a concert once somewhere in New York City <laughs> And he invited Prabhupada to come. So the concert was him jumping up and down on the strings inside the piano keyboard and hitting the keys with his fist. And, you know, one of these kind of very performance art things. Prabhupada sat through the whole thing. And then at the end of the concert, you know, the, the sky came up to Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, very nice. <laughs> Went back to the temple. I mean, it's like ridiculous, but he was offering encouragement. He was offering encouragement. Does it cost you so much that you have to condemn you can't encourage somebody? Come on. Okay. (laughs) That's beautiful. eh? (laughs) I'll give you one last story, and then we'll say goodbye. I might have told you this story already. I was with Prabhupada in his room at Bhaktivedanta Manor. And um, there was a, a, a reception for the neighbors in that you know, part of London, uh, the suburbs of London. And uh, there was a stage and there was a rock band. They were playing rock and roll music, like Rolling Stones, whatever. And the music was coming right in Prabhupada's window. And I, I asked him, is this okay with you? So he stood up and he went to the window and he looked down on the stage, on the lawn out back. And um, all this rock and roll music, literally rock and roll. This is straight up rock and roll. And he said, um, are they going to chant Hare Krishna? 
I said, yeah, I think that's the idea is that they're, you know, attracting people with all of the rock and roll stuff. And then they'll play the Maha Mantra. I said, then it's okay. <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. It's okay. And I said, well, how is it you, um, you closed the road show. There, was, there had been a traveling road show with a couple of um, buses and again, electric instruments. And it was all plays about Krishna conscious themes. I said, you stopped the road show. How is it that you're okaying this rock and roll stuff? He said, no, I, I stopped the road show because it wasn't being properly managed. You know, they were so much into the performance. They were forgetting their spiritual practices. So he was somebody for everything. everything. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. So you could also say from this from this incident, it's a beautiful incident. You could say one principle that even if something was uh, say not done during Prabhupada's times, that doesn't necessarily mean it was like a mandate that that should not never be done. Maybe it was just circumstantially that that, that was not the right time to do it. Yeah, and this you and I have talked about before. Yeah. We should never make the mistake of thinking that the only thing that can be done is something that Prabhupada did. That's the biggest mistake that you could ever make. Prabhupada, with 12 years, was his mission, right? How could he do everything in the world? He wanted us to go further than he did. That was his whole mission, was to encourage us, to expand on his mission. To, to find new applications. You know? There was no internet when he was here. There was no personal computers when he was here. Does that mean we shouldn't use them just because Prabhupada never did? Come on, mm. let's get real. It's beautifully put. Yes, so, <laughs> so that would mean that, it, that on one side, the devotees uh, who are say, leading, they, they need to give some space for those who are creative. And another point is that the crea creative devotee, inclined devotees, should not uh, you can should not feel hesitant or guilty when they are trying to express their creativity, even if it is in small ways for serving Krishna. Hmm? Yeah, I mean the the, the 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 test will be if while you are pursuing your creative talents and interests, you're not compromising your spiritual. If you're able to maintain your spiritual life, that's a good hint, good clue. If you want to know whether you're doing the right thing, is what I'm doing compromising me spiritually? And if it's not, then pursue it. See where it leads you. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Give it a try. See what happens. Wonderful. That's, that's the kind <laughs> of spirit which Prabhupada used in... We could say sharing Krishna consciousness all over the world. He himself went to America. He sent his disciples to various parts of the world. So yeah. we could say that that same spirit, which is applied in the physical domain, that now we apply more in the artistic domain. So how many really we say, for example, how many of, of us have composed poetry in, a, in our movement in English, for example, mm -hmm. Bhakti poetry. So there's so much that you can do. It's a beautiful metaphor to sign off with you. It brings, the, uh, it brings the adventurousness of Krishna consciousness into the creative domain also. Absolutely. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> this is Krishna consciousness. Go for it. You've got nothing to lose. <laughs> but just don't forget your spiritual practices. Beautiful. <laughs> yes, bro. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try to summarize if it's okay. And then I, I summarize briefly in between. But... We talked about cre creativity in bhakti, nurturing, or even not just nurturing, it was like, how do we first see creativity in bhakti? And then if you consider trajectory, philosophy is essential initially to get us on the path, get us moving. But once we are moving, it's all about uh, poetry, art, drama, music, dance, song. And that's where the heart is expressed. And we have so many, we have so many artistic you could say Acharyas, Kavi Karanapur and uh, Rupa Goswami, Minchu Goswami to some himself also. So then in that connection, you talked about 
your interaction with Prabhupada. This is something which you have spoken many times that Loka Praman and Shastra Praman. And Prabhupada, in one sense, Prabhupada appreciated you reading and you had a natural attraction toward that. And then you have used it both in in your professional life as well as now you are using you are using devotional life also for writing many books so in general if we look at creativity it is a gift from krishna and in one sense its creativity is the act of being it is it's it's being with the creator in a sense being a channel for the creator yeah, very nice you know? so then in that sense a very krishna conscious very god conscious krishna conscious activity but there are two ways. One is that when people who are in that zone, in that flow, they realize it's a state of, you know, there's, I, I disappear, as you said, so poignantly quoting that, that artist. So, but it could also be that those people afterwards or later, they have a huge ego. So for us, the challenge would be that we are not going to dissolve or destroy the ego, but we want to use what we have in Krishna's service. Manage so it. Manage that. It, it is not a it is not building our ego. It is not breaking our ego. It's more, more like link, offering our ourselves, our being to Krishna. Very nice. And so then we can see also that when we are trying to serve Krishna, who knows, Krishna can give our, take our artistic ability beyond what we normally have, what we karmically have. Yes. And yes. then we talked about how you are writing on Bukun Mahaprabhu. I look forward to that. Now, all your lifelong writing literary skills now. Are we perfected in, in <laughs> Lord Chaitanya's service? In, in the latter half, we discussed a spiritual movement. At one level, creativity means uh, vulnerability. We're putting ourselves out there. You don't know how things will perform, things will manifest, how people respond. So it is difficult. And that same insecurity may come at a, in a spiritual tradition also where we start fearing Oh, this has not been done. How will this work out? So the individual themselves may fear or the, the leaders may fear creative expressions because yeah. there is a certain element of structure and conformity that is required. But that conformity should not suppress. And in that connection, we need to meet people where they are at and engage them. Creative, you get the example of how Prabhupada and the devotees work with George Harrison. He did it at his own pace and he wrote extraordinary poems, glorifying songs, songs talk about the spiritual world and songs about Krishna. So rather than forcing it, we need to just, you could say, facilitate it gently like Prabhu. You know, maybe we could have another podcast on your experiences of how Prabhupada dealt with George Harrison. <laughs> when you're talking about it, I thought we could go in that direction, but then it would have been a different subject. That, that you should talk to Sham Sundar. He's the man. <laughs> you know, but you wrote a biography in one sense. You were also immersed in it. Yeah. So then... After that, we discussed about uh, when we are, so there is, to some extent, faithfulness and conformity is required, no doubt. Our, our following tradition is required. But at the same time, when we are, we also mean compassion means that we don't want to just convert people to our way. It just, we are, it's more of manifesting or realizing or we'll say unveiling of who they already are. So rather than being in, too insecure, there's a preference. I may like to do things in a particular, I may like to offer only scriptural prayers. Others want to do other things. Let me give them space for that. And in this way, devotees can, as you said, go for it. What is there to lose? As long as we keep ourselves spiritually connected, then go for it. Yes. I, I love that metaphor, actually. What do you brought about that? It's adventure in the creative domain. It's like there's adventure in physical travel. It's an adventure Krishna. in artistic travel. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am victory and adventure. Yes. <laughs> so, what a pleasure to talk with you really, it's such uh, a delight uh, true thank you very much video. for sparing your time i look forward to having many more discussions with you in future me too thank, thank you bro. thank you bro. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.